This is the second longest river of Europe after the Volga and the, and, and the largest river of Europe. So I was born into a very beautiful and very <coughs> cultured city. And not only that, but I was born into a wealthy family and I had an absolutely dream childhood. I had the best that life could offer. We had people to serve us, we had maids, we had cooks, I had a governess, I had a nanny. So I was born into a wonderfully privileged family. Now, Budapest had a, uh, Hungary had a lot of Jews, about 600,000. And the head of our country was called Horty. You don't have to remember that name, but his name was Miklos Horty, and he was a, a very good friend of Adolf Hitler. I'm trying to find, well, you won't be able to see it because the pictures are too small. But you can perhaps see this is our head of state, this guy here, right next to his best friend Adolf Hitler. So, much as Budapest and Hungary was a wonderful place to be born and grow up. It was always an anti-Semitic country. Going back many, many years to the beginning of the century, even to the 1800, there was always anti-Semitism and it was fostered and it was not, it was under the surface, you know. We lived in a country where you traveled on the tram and somebody said, Look at that ugly Jew, what an ugly typical Jewish nose. Don't stand next to a Jew because the Jews smell. Always that kind of a talk, you know, underground. It, and, and it was fostered, but it was never really, it was not like in Germany. I mean, our head of state was not an out and out murderer like Adolf Hitler was. But what I have to tell you is that it was wonderful to be Hungarian. It was an extremely cultured country and city but it was very anti-Semitic, and as I say, our head of state is sitting next to his best friend, Adolf Hitler. As the years went by, of course, Hitler conquered all of Europe. First it was Austria, which we are next, then came Czechoslovakia, Poland, and all the other, so many other countries like France, and uh, Italy, Italy, of course, and even Norway and Denmark, so Europe was eaten up by Adolf Hitler, and wherever Adolf Hitler went, his first priority was get rid of your Jews. My goal is to make Europe Jewless. We have to wipe that rotten race off the face of the earth. So the Jews were everywhere where Hitler uh, came, the Jews were rounded up, and I'm sure you have heard of it, mostly they were put into cattle cars and shipped off to Auschwitz, where they immediately were selected. Those who could work were still working, the others went to the gas chambers. But Hungary was an exception, because we were so friendly with Hitler on the side, they considered us an ally, and they left us alone for quite a few years. Where while all the other countries were swallowed up and the Jews were exterminated, we in the early 1940s still lived a very good life, except that there were Jewish laws that prevented people to go to college, to university. Jewish people were kicked out of their jobs, so it was tightening around it, but there was nothing like in Poland, for instance, where already everybody was dead. So we lived a very complacent and very good life, and nothing happened. Then things began to change. Hitler, who was a crazy idiot, decided to attack Russia and occupy Russia as well, which is not possible. Nobody, not Napoleon or nobody else could conquer Russia ever. So Hitler was not successful either and he suffered a lot of losses and things began to turn for the Germans and it, looked, it began to look like they're not going to be the conquerors of the whole world but things were bad. Then of course in 1941, December 7, Pearl Harbor 
and the Americans got into the war, so it became much more even. Hitler could not just conquer every territory that he imagined that he can conquer. He, the Russian troops resisted Hitler's advances, turned the German army back, they suffered tremendous losses, and the Allies landed on the 6th of June 1944 and pushed into Europe and the Germans were getting a little bit weaker. So now Adolf Hitler told Mr. Horty, our head of state, listen, get with it, get with it, get rid of your Jews. You still got a completely untouched population of Jews. What are you waiting for? I have eliminated practically all the other Jews. Horty, our head of state, was not a stupid boy. He began to see that the winds of war are changing, that the Russians are pushing into Europe from the east and the Allies are pushing into Europe from the northwest. And he wanted out. He tried to negotiate a peace treaty and that was when Adolf Hitler said, oh yeah, fine ally you are, to hell with you. And that is when he sent in his troops to conquer Hungary. And that was in 1944, the 19th of March, and we were the last country that Hitler conquered, and the last group of Jews that were waiting to be exterminated. And I, I don't know what your age is, you are about 16, 17 or less. I was 13 years old when uh, the Germans occupied Hungary. I was just a little girl beginning to live. I said to my mother, Mommy, can I cut my pigtails? Can I wear a grown-up hairdo? Can I wear high heels? Can I wear maybe lipstick? I was just beginning to live. Halfway I was still a child, I still had my toys, I still had my books, my children's books, but I was beginning to notice that there are boys in the world. I looked at the boys and the boys looked back and life was exciting, except that that was when my life came to an end. They stole my childhood, they stole my first teen years, and the Germans, because our head of state wanted out to jump out because he saw that Germany will lose the war eventually and he knew that if we are going to be on Hitler's side, Hungary will be terribly punished. So he wanted to negotiate and all of a sudden we became an enemy too. And towards, it was getting towards the end of the war, but we were the last country and they invaded us and our lives came to an end. What happened first was there were many uh, people, many Jewish people living in Budapest, which was the capital city. Quite a number of very sophisticated and wealthy Jews and politically well-connected Jews, but there were also a lot of people, Jewish people living in rural areas. I remember it was a Sunday, beautiful, lovely, uh, spring Sunday, my father took me to an art museum and when we left the art museum and tried to get a tram to go home, we saw tanks, we saw military vehicles, we saw that horrible greyish blue uniforms of the soldiers marching in and the Hungarians looked at each other, what is happening? It was a complete surprise that the Nazis took the, my country over. What they did first, when they occupied it, they sent a lot of very highly placed Nazis into Hungary. One of them was called Adolf Eichmann, who was pretty well known. And there were others, top-rate uh, Nazis, to finish with the Hungarian Jews and get them off the face of the earth. The people in the rural areas were all rounded up the next day that the Germans invaded us, put into ghettos, 
put into cattle cars and immediately shipped off to Auschwitz so that the rural Jews who lived in the countryside were almost completely to the last person destroyed and murdered right away. And then Hitler said to Horty, hey, what about those, those sophisticated, stuck-up Budapest Jews? Let's get rid of them too. What do you want? You want to stick them in a, in a uh, I don't know, in a museum? We want to get rid of them too. So March 19th was the day that they came and immediately they issued orders and there were posters uh, stuck on the side of the houses what we can and what we cannot do. The first thing was that every Jew was branded and the branding was the yellow star. Well, I'm at a loss here because I was hoping that we can project this on the wall that I wanted to show you what we, what we used to look like. That's me when I was a little girl. I was a little bit older than that, when the Germans attacked us. See, I'm wearing something in a Hungarian post box, just like any other little girl. Would you and mind, would the, okay to, would the video okay to pass around? Yeah, please? if I can. Yeah. You see, that's me, would you like an to innocent pass? little girl who uh, was just beginning her life. Here I am with my grandmother. I'm the one with the pictures. <laughs> and that is just about a couple of years later when the Germans came. is what happened right away. Am I funny? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, so the Germans came, the rural uh, Jews were deported, and we, the Hungarian Jews, were left. The next thing was the branding. You had to wear a yellow star of David on your lapel. Without it, you could not go on the street because if they found you without it and turned out that you were a Jew, they could shoot you, they could put it, whatever. I mean, it was a, a reign of terror. Everybody had to wear that. And then we were told that we have to leave our houses and our apartments and move into a sort of a ghetto that was called the Jewish building. And every building has a Star of David on it. That meant only Jews live in this, in this house. So I had to pack up all my things as a child on the overnight bag, had to put on a yellow star if I wanted to go on the street, and we moved into a Jewish house. And there was a part of the city that was called the Jewish part of the city and only had uh, houses with the yellow stars on it. That was a ghetto and we were not allowed to go to the street only about two, two hours a day from 12 to 2, always with the thing. And we were in constant fear of our lives because we knew that we are under the terror of these crazy, crazy Nazis and that a lot of our family has already been deported and murdered. But we lived on and we lived on and we, we, we were hoping because all the time we knew that Germany is going to lose the war because the Russians pushed ahead and the Allies from the other side pushed ahead. And we were hoping and waiting that maybe they get to us before the Nazis do get to us. Then autumn came and that is when the Hungarian Holocaust differs from any other stories that you might have heard. Towards the autumn, uh, the head of our state, that Mr. Miklos Horty, decided that he wants to jump out completely and wants to negotiate peace with the Allies. And when Hitler heard that, he engineered a takeover of the Horty government and they put a new government in place, which was the most frightening that anybody can imagine. 
that was the Arrow Cross government, made up of the most violent and vile mass murdering Nazis. This is their this is their logo. This is the same as the swastika, but this was only in Hungary. <laughs> See? Arrow cross. That was their logo. I'll show you other pictures. This Hungary in the middle. That when we saw that here, they wore it on their arms, just like the Nazis. When we saw that, we knew that death is staring us in the face. Terrible. That was a terrible, terrible bunch. And they took over the government, and they said to Hitler, we will do your bidding. We will kill those lousy, stinking 80,000 Budapest Jews who are still alive. Don't worry. We will finish them off. And that's exactly what happened. But then something else happened that only happened in Hungary, in no other country. So remember that. That is why the Hungarian Holocaust is different from every other country. Since everybody thought by then, it was the end of 1944, that the Germans will definitely lose the war. Some countries, neutral countries, rose up. Now those countries were Sweden, Switzerland, Spain, Portugal, and also the Vatican. Now they very often criticized Pope Pius that he didn't do enough for the Jews. But there was a group of Vatican representatives who were trying to save the Hungarian, the Budapest <coughs> Jews. These five entities rose up and said to Hitler, enough, enough of the murder. You have done enough. You have killed everybody in Europe and in Hungary. Don't you dare to touch those last few Budapest Jews. I and my family were, of course, among them. We lived still in those houses with the yellow star. We were scared to death constantly. And when we heard that uh, the head of state wanted to pull Hungary <coughs> out, we were all celebrating. But a few hours later came this arrow cross government and we knew that we were in because they will really murder us all. Well, these countries who stood up and said, we will not allow you. We are going to protect these Budapest Jews. They are no longer Budapest Jews, but they are Swedish citizens under the protection of the Swedish government or Swiss, or Spanish, or Portuguese, or under the protection of the Vatican. Don't you dare to touch their heads. And they gave us protection papers. And I've got a couple of um, things to show you here. Well, that's not the best way to do it, unfortunately. But I, I have them in the office my this is what they issued, for instance, the Swiss. They issued official on their letterhead, and the Swedes, that you are, a, you are no longer a Budapest Jew, you are a Swedish uh, citizen, or you are a Swiss citizen. And people were storming the various embassies, begging for these protection letters, because we really believe that this will protect us from the arrow cross and from their horror. And not only did they issue passes, but they opened up safe houses. So there were Swedish houses, and there were Swiss houses, and there were Portuguese, and Vatican, and they all had the escutcheon on, on the entrance. And we left those buildings with the big Jewish David star, and we each moved into one of those protected buildings. My family and I, we had Portuguese papers, and we moved into a Portuguese protected building. And there were so many people in these protected houses that people slept in the elevator and sat in the staircases because we all flocked and thought that Switzerland or Spain or, or Portugal or Sweden is going to protect us. 
Of course, I'm sure you heard, I probably think you heard of Raoul Wallenberg, the Swedish diplomat who came from a very fine family and who uh, was very active in Hungary trying to save Jewish people and he was of course leading that whole thing, whole, whole protection thing. So we became four. Ha ha! But the arrow cross didn't like that. What are these damn foreigners doing coming in here and trying to save those stinky bloody Jews? How dare they do these things in Hungary? We are at home, we are Hungarians, to hell with the foreigners. And they started a bloodbath in Budapest at the end of the year 1944, the like of which very seldom happened in history. They started to butcher people on the street. They broke into hospitals where they knew that they were Jewish patients <coughs> and shot them in their beds, shot the doctors, shot the nursing staff. Anywhere they broke into places and just mass murdered everybody. They couldn't give a damn if we called ourselves Swedish or Portuguese or whatever. The main thing was butcher these last 80,000 Jews. And we were looking out in the street from our uh, apartment through the window and we very often saw groups being marched and accompanied by these uh, uh, arrow cross socks. Some of them marched straight ahead, but a lot of them marched to the right. And we knew that if you were marched to the right, you were taken straight to the river Danube, that beautiful, long, romantic river lined up and just shot into the Danube. Before they were shot, they were told to remove their shoes. And after they were all murdered, the murderers took the shoes because shoes were very important personal possessions and just stole the shoes. And these poor people, they were murdered and their bodies swimming in the icy Danube River. By that time, Budapest was under siege. The Russians were around the corner and we were saying to us, who will get to us first? the arrow cross murderers or the Russians to liberate us. Well, one day a bunch of arrow cross people broke into our building. By that time we were living in the air raid shelter. There was no water, there was no electricity, no food, nothing. All of us were living in the shelter of the Portuguese protected building and the Nazis, the arrow cross people broke into uh, the building and said, up the courtyard, everybody, line up. And I remember I was only about 13 years old and I was holding my mother's hand one and my grandmother's hand on the other. And we said goodbye to each other because we were prepared that they will either take us to the Danube or will just shoot us right away. And they lined us up and they started to march us. But we were not led to the right, to the Danube, we were led straight on and we said to each other, we whispered to each other, well, maybe they're not going to kill us, right? Maybe we, we get still, maybe we will go on living. And truly, they marched us to the other side of the town into a very old quarter that used to be a ghetto kind of a settlement before the war. Everything was bombed out. It was guarded by Nazis, by the Aero Cross, Whatever little food we had, they took everything away from us and we found our way into a bomb building. There was nothing to eat, there was no electricity, no water, and we found a little part where we were sort of a little bit safe. The bombs were falling because the Russians were in the next block. And yet we were sitting there in a so-called air raid center still wondering whether in the last minute they will butcher us, because that's why they took us all into one place. And then a new year started, 1945, and on the 18th of January, the door bust open, and we thought it was the arrow cross with the guns to kill us, but it was a Russian soldier. He had the five, the red star, you know, with the five point and a fur hat and he trained his gun on us, he didn't know who we were, and somebody started to shout, we've been liberated by the Russians, the ghetto doors are open, let's flee. And we did just that. And we climbed up 
and we were on the street. The street was full of dead people. There was a big bunch of people bending over something on the street. We found out later they were cutting up a dead horse for food. And we ran like crazy because the Russians did come and did liberate us in time. And after the war, we found out that this ghetto where we spent the last few days of this horrible occupation was a minefield, and they were all ready to detonate it and send the last of the Jewish people you know, to their death. But the fact that I lived through it, and that my parents lived through it, and that we were not deported, and uh, you know, that is just an absolute, absolute accident of fate. Uh, my parents were divorced. I lived with my mother, stepfather, and at that time with my grandmother. And my father lived in a different building. He was under Swedish protection. And they caught him on the street two minutes after curfew. And, you know, they had a way of identifying among the males who was Jewish and who was not. In Europe, in Hungary, only the Jewish males were circumcised. And what the, uh, these horrible Nazis did, they pulled the man under a door, made him open his fly, and when he, they saw that he was circumcised, that meant he was Jewish, that meant he was dead. And they did the same thing to my father, and I was told by somebody who witnessed it that uh, he was herded towards the Danube. So he was one of those people who was shot into the Danube. And uh, I don't know if you know these, these images. Hunger finally created, it's very difficult like this. Well, anyway, this, this is a good picture. Just a few years ago, Hungary finally did something that was decent, and they created a memorial to all those people who were shot into the Danube, you see? And it is memorialized by the shoes they were told to take off and leave behind. You see? And this is like Hungary's national memorial to that ter terrible, terrible time when they took people and shot them into the river. And this year there was news that they found bones and human remains in the Danube and then they did a test genetic test and they uh, confirmed that, that these were remains from these martyrs who were shot in 1944 into the Danube and we were, I mean, I got emails to, the, to that extent that uh, they are going to take out all the remains and give them a decent funeral, you know, in the Jewish uh, way and, you know, so many years after they found and finally did the right thing. And unfortunately, Hungary is one of those countries that still remains quite anti-Semitic, as opposed to Germany, who uh, is very decent and where Holocaust denial is punished by jail. But the Hungarians, it's in their genes. So we were liberated. This is not really part of the story, but I'm going to tell you that part of the Holocaust story. We were liberated and we lived in a completely bombed out city, Budapest, and the bridges across the Danube were destroyed, and we still had nothing to eat, and no light, no electricity. It took quite a while to get a reasonably normal way back to life. And we rebuilt our wonderful business that gave us a very good living and made us quite wealthy in the old days and we had a beautiful new apartment, and we started to live again, and by that time I was 15 and 16, and I had cut my pigtails, and I met boys, and I did go to dances, 
and I could use lipstick so I could have all my dreams that I had before the Nazis came realized. And I had two or three wonderful years and then terrible things happened again. The communist regime took over Hungary and with one uh, stroke of the pen they took away everything from us. All the wealth of our family, our businesses, the high rises that my grandfather built and another terrible regime took over for many, many, many years in Hungary. My mother said to me, I don't want you to live in another horrible regime. I want to send you out abroad to the West. And I went to school in Switzerland and I was separated from my parents who tried to leave the country illegally. They were caught, they were put into a concentration camp for many years under the Russian system. So we had two terrible, terrible uh, terror systems in Hungary in those years. First the Nazis and immediately after the communists. So many things happened and then later on I lived <coughs> in England and met my husband and got married and came to America. And every time I see the stars and stripes, I say to myself, thank God, and I pinch myself that it's true that I'm in America and not in Hungary and not under the Nazis and not under the communists. And that is about all, unless you want to, I'm sure you may have questions. That's too many questions. <laughs> oh? Yeah. Was the head of state in uh, in Hungary, was he elected or was he, uh, was it more like a... Was the head of Hungary, was he elected? The, the head of Hungary in the 30s was elected. Okay. And uh, he should have been declared a war criminal, Mr. Miklos Horty, who for several, many years was bosom buddy with uh, Hitler. But because Towards the end of the war, he tried to jump out and negotiate. They said, you can go, and he retired to Portugal and lived there for a long while and died a natural death. But he should have been tried in Nuremberg with the other Nazi war criminals. Kathy? Yes. You, you gave a rough estimate that there were 600,000 Jews 600, before. Jews. 600,000 Jews. Pardon me, I'm sorry, just, to, just like, we're, uh, I'm going to enable you to see some of the pictures that uh, she, she was mentioning during the presentation. 600,000 Jews were killed uh, in 10 months because we were only <coughs> occupied for 10 months in Budapest. We were the last one, as I said before, uh, who was occupied. And in those months of occupation, 10 months, uh, they killed uh, 600,000 Jewish people. We were they really decimated. Uh, how many, is there a guesstimate on how many survived? How many Hungarian yes. Jews there were at the end oh, of the war? Oh, about 120,000. You know, people were hiding out. They had Christian papers. There were some nuns that were hiding people out in various uh, places, you know. and. Uh, some survived like I did, but quite a lot of my friends, the same age, 13 years old, died. You know, and people like that died. You know, killing, killing people like that, you know, you have to have something in you that's not normal. And they killed babies. They killed children, pregnant women, you know, all of these. Who will tell their stories? How, how, can, you, how can you kill something <coughs> that is angelic and sweet as that? Yeah? Did you say you were being, like, protected? When you were in these buildings, were they, like, armed with, or were there, like, soldiers outside? Were they protecting, or were they, like, just hiding you places? Like, did they know where you guys were being hidden? Like, were you being just, like, held somewhere, or were they actively, like, You mean when we were under the protected yeah. house? No, they were houses, and they had the escutcheon. If you got a Swedish paper, there was this uh, Swedish escutcheon, 
and we were always identified. The Nazis always knew where Jews were, first in the buildings with the yellow star and then later on the buildings that were so-called protected buildings. That was very important because if they decided to murder a few hundred Jews, they knew where to go, make sure they don't kill their own families or so. And, and they just, you know, randomly killed because they, they became completely crazy towards the end of the war. Then they begin to feel that it's over for them, that Nazism is kaput. And, and that they, they, they were afraid of the American, of the English, of the, of the Russians. You know, so they wanted to kill as many as long as they could, and they did. And this thing that is like the swastika, the arrow cross on their arm, when we saw that, we knew that we were looking that You know how many times I looked into the barrel of a machine gun? That I'm here is really a miracle. So, you know. I think what he was actually asking was, it was just a piece of paper and a designation oh. of a building. There were no Swedes, there were no, no Danish no, soldiers, no, no, there was no. nobody all, there to actually all, offer. They were all Budapest Jews. Right. The only Swede who was active was Raoul Wallenberg. And he arranged a lot. He negotiated with the Nazis because what I said before that we were in a place that was a minefield and the Nazis planned in the last minute to detonate it. Allegedly, we heard that it was Raoul Wallenberg who negotiated with a Nazi general and told him, if you kill these few 20 or 30,000 Jews in the ghetto, I make sure that you hang tomorrow because the Russians are around the corner. Of course, we all know Raoul was murdered. By the, he well, went missing. Yeah, probably. He that went was, missing. That was the most awful injustice of, of God. Because he, he saved so, uh, technically he saved me too because I was in that place that was undermined. And in a day or two they would have just detonated it and sent everybody. Because they were hell-bent to follow Hitler's orders that Europe should be, had no Jews. And this is what happens when intolerance is there, that one race or one color or one religion is better or worse than the other, because that creates bloodshed, intolerance. So, uh, you know, uh, we are very, very... Jay? Mind me asking, how old are you currently? I can't hear it, I'm hard of it. <laughs> He's asking how old you are. How old do you think? <laughs> <laughs> you tell me. Old enough. Obviously. Mm -hmm. Obviously 20. 20. Joking. Uh, Not 20. I'm um, three, three times 20. But you tell me. I'm very curious how I look to people. You look like 70, I'd say. Yeah. Huh? Nicole! About like 70. <laughs> <laughs> Nicole! She, she said 70. <laughs> Six. I think like 50. Maybe like... 85. Like, 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 I'm 85. You know what? Flag Day is my birthday because I'm such a patriotic American that I was even a, a, an American in my mother's womb. I was born on the 14th of June, which is Flag Day in the USA, and I'm going to be 86. What? Wow. 86. Just as old as you are, because I'm up with my texting, with my email, with my computer, uh, with the music, and with all the technology there is, and that is keeping me young, because I, I refuse to be old, act old, or feel old, and I do all the things, well not all the things, but all the technological things that can be done, you know, I want to be with it. But I am not a young girl, but I feel like it. Another question? Yeah. <coughs> so Wait a minute, I'm coming closer. One thing is true, my hearing is not as it used to be. Will you understand? Nice and loud, nice. Yeah. yeah. So given the circumstances with what was going on in Hungary, did you ever feel angry about your religion or your background, or did you use it to kind of unite with the people around you? I, I'm feeling only angry about Hungary. I hate them. I loathe them. These Hungarians now in circulation are the grandchildren of those mass murderers. But what, 
I only went back once to Hungary to see my grandparents' graves who are buried there, but I would not give them a penny to buy a cup of coffee or anything to do with Hungary. I loathe them. I hate them. I consider America, well, listen, I lived here for 50 years, and America is my home, English is my mother tongue. I know I've got a sick accent, I know that. But uh, I can't help it because I was 18 when I left Hungary, 18. And I left, lived many years in Australia. Thank God I'm here for 50 years. So uh, I don't want to have, I'm not angry at my religion. Actually, I was brought up in a home that had no religion at all. We were racially, you know, if you had a grandmother who was Jewish or two grandparents, you were a stinking Jew. But uh, I was brought up totally without religion. Actually, we had Christmas tree and we had that, you know, completely. But racially, I was identified as Jewish. Of course not, uh, you know. I, uh, then I married a man who was very observant, so I got to really know the Jewish religion lately. But as far as I'm only, I only hate one entity, and that's Hungary. I cannot forgive them. I cannot forgive them what, what they did. And another thing, Germany did horrible things, but they are sorry. They are very pro-Israel. They are helping Jewish people. They have played vast sums of restitution. They accept their culpability. But the Hungarian. He denied nothing. So, no, I, I, I belong here. That's what, I, that's what I feel very strongly. Every time we travel to Europe, to other countries, you know, when my husband was alive. And when we came back, I felt like doing what the Pope did, just bend down and kiss the earth. It's wonderful to be here. Okay, last question. <coughs> I was just wondering, like, since I know, like, during the Holocaust, like, Many Jews got um, a number like yes. branded in their um, mm -hmm. arm. Like, mm -hmm. if you had a number, no, we did not. Only those people had numbers who were in death camps. People mainly in Auschwitz or uh, Majdanek, Treblinka, Buchenwald, Birkenau. All those death camps. They tattooed them because they had to work and they had to be identified. We were not. We were not. We and and we. You know. The interesting thing is, this I still have to say, and then I think that the other group is coming. So uh, the interesting uh, thing is that at the Nuremberg uh, processes, the G Nazi Germans said they could not have done a quarter of the damage if it would not have been for the enthusiastic help of the Hungarian people. They were collaborators with the Nazis, and they did everything. They, the, that Arrow Cross people were worse than the worst SS people. They really, really wanted to, uh, you know, murder us and so. So the Hungarians played in with the Nazis. They were worse. The Germans, I, a German never touched me. It was uh, the Arrow Cross people, the Hungarian Nazis. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time. Everybody is the same, no matter what your religion, what your race, what your color, what your creed, because the opposite, you know, singling out a group of people and murdering them, that's terrible. That's the only thing that I, I quote from the, you know, one of the things that I quote from. One of the things I hate most is racism in any shape or form. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank